This meeting is now being recorded. That you stage the uh, the work so that you first focus on one aspect, then you add in another aspect. And so today's webinar is really going to be a, a collection of different perspectives on how how do we work to achieve all of these goals together. Um, one common model is really to start with performance and R&D on the performance, and then on a second stage you bring in the usability, get the user feedback. And so the first two presentations are really focused on that. The first one will be more focused on R&D and performance, looking ahead to usability. The second presentation will be um, the, the R&D is completed now, and they're now looking at um, optimizing the technology for users. The third presentation then looks a little bit more broadly at some questions on the overall strategy to reach these goals, the trade-offs, the synergies. Um, and the fourth presentation is more of a portfolio approach, looking at um, a number of different projects together, as well as looking ahead to dissemination of some of these learnings on how do we do R&D, how do we innovate. Um, and you will all have heard that uh, the message that the webinar is being recorded. This is to let everyone know that um, we are recording the web webinar so that we can share it with all of our partners who weren't able to join in the meeting today. The lineup that we have of speakers today is, first we have Jessica Treiner from Colorado State University. Um, she'll be talking about some experimental and modeling techniques to characterize um, stove performance, looking at different operating conditions, different fuel types, that robustness idea. Um, and that's the, the example of someone relatively in the earlier stage of R&D. So the next presentation is they've, they've worked through a lot of the technology components, but that now they want to bring the technology in front of users. And that will be Patrick Sherwin and Matthew Gillespie from GoSun Stove. Um, they've developed a solar vacuum stove um, that is, um, there are currently some variations of that product available on the market now, and they're now looking to optimize it for users and the cuisine in Guatemala. The third presenter is Karin Carter from Catapult Design to talk more broadly about a user-centered design approach and challenges for balancing um, that user-centered design approach with achieving significant innovations. And our last presenter today is Elliot Levine with the U.S. Department of Energy will, who will give an overview of DOE's research portfolio focused on R&D for biomass cook stoves, as well as um, looking ahead to some of these dissemination aspects as well. Before we go to the, uh, the speakers, there are a couple other things that I want to mention. Um, one is to think about all of these uh, innovation activities in a broader context, relating to how we think about setting our goals and then driving towards our goals as well. Um, so I wanted to highlight how a lot of this innovation work fits in with um, some of the other activities that are going on. Um, so for example, developing standards, that's setting the goals and setting the goals that we want to be reaching towards innovation. There's also um, building up capacity for testing around the world so that we can actually evaluate the innovations and see and track how they're improving over time. And data transparency is also very critical here in that in order to be able to have a good understanding of how technologies are improving, technologies and fuels that we need to have consistent and public information shared. Um, there's also some work going on to think about the, the policy and regulation that will foster a culture of innovation as well, thinking about how do we implement standards through regulations or through labeling, for example, and, and uh, we won't talk about it here, but we've got some work going on there. And then, of course, all of that lays the groundwork for people who are working to improve technologies and fuels to address the challenges of, of cooking around the world. 
I also wanted to make a quick announcement um, for, for people who are listening to the webinar regarding the Pilot Innovation Fund. The next round, round three, um, the applications will open October 1, and they'll be open for one month. Um, so we want to make sure to take this opportunity today to let people know that this is coming so that you guys can start thinking about ideas and partnerships. And so the, uh, to give you an overview of the Pilot Innovation Fund Round 3, this is a continuation of a grant mechanism focused on technology, fuel, and business model innovations. This is across the value chain from product design to consumer finance. Um, one of the reasons we want to get the word out that this um, the application open period is coming is that we want to encourage people to seek out innovative partnerships, um, to bring new players into the sector and work with people who do have a lot of experience as an opportunity um, to create some new ideas here. And that is really the, the focus of this round of Pilot Innovation Fund. We really want to have game-changing ideas that we support in this round. Um, in, in the past, it's been a mix of iterative um, improvements as well as game-changing things, but here um, the, we think the sector is really ready to focus on some game-changing ideas. And so this time there will be, in order to support that, these game-changing ideas, there will be grants up to $150,000. And keep an eye out on the URL that's listed on this slide for more information. Um, and you, there will be more details about the application requirements and the scope um, when the, the Pilot Innovation Fund opens up. The final uh, more business announcement related thing is for future webinars. Um, right for today's uh, webinar, we have a a sample of some of the innovative projects that are going on, um, but we really want to uh, welcome people to submit ideas for future webinars. Uh, we do have a lot of people lined up who uh, are who have are planning to present um, in the next few months, and we'd like to have this theme as a webinar series. Um, but if you haven't been in touch with us about presenting at a webinar, please do. Go to the link that's listed here and um, use the form to submit your ideas so that we can consider it for future webinars. And at this point, we will okay, switch it perfect. To you. We'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Jessica. Hi, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica Treiner, and today I'm here with Morgan DeFort to talk about a research project that we are working on at Colorado State University entitled Achieving Tier 4 Emissions and Efficiency in Biomass Cookstoves. This project is funded by the Department of Energy, and as of now, we're a little over a year into the project. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the motivation for this project, uh, the approach that we're taking, where we're at with our experimental work, and what to look forward to in terms of published experimental results and tools for cook stove design. Let's get started by talking about the motivation for the approach that we are taking. In this project, we are focusing on achieving tier four emissions and efficiency in biomass cook stoves through the top lit updraft or TWAT semi gasifier cook stove design. Why are we focusing on semi-gas fire cookstoves? Well, the ISO IWA tiers for high power emissions are shown on this graph. And three stone fires fall out here in tier zero, along with traditional charcoal stoves, which exhibit lower particulate matter emissions but high carbon monoxide emissions. Wood-burning rocket elbow cookstoves exhibit reduced carbon monoxide and particulate matter emissions compared to a three-stone fire. And Jim Jetter at the EPA has tested many biomass cookstoves and shown that rocket elbow cookstove performance can range from Tier 1, which represents the first level of performance improvement over a three-stone fire, all the way up to Tier 3. Semi-gas fire cookstoves, however, 
have been shown to be capable of achieving lower carbon monoxide and particulate matter emissions than other cookstove designs. Test results for several semi-gas fire cookstoves fall solidly in the Tier 3 range and approach Tier 4. This is why we have interest in the semi-gas fire cookstove design. However, test results for some semi-gas fire cookstoves indicate that they can have emissions that are comparable to or worse than a three-stone fire. Test results from our laboratory here at CSU have also demonstrated this wide range of performance. Overall, there is still more work to be done to design semi-gas fire cookstoves that achieve Tier 4 emissions, and there is still more work to be done to design semi-gas fire cookstoves that exhibit less variable performance. We need to characterize semi-gas fire cookstove performance and the combustion process that occurs inside of a semi-gas fire cookstove in more detail. To review, this diagram illustrates how a top-lit updraft semi-gas fire cookstove operates. Fuel is batch-fed into the stove and the top of the fuel bed is ignited. The devolatilization of the fuel, which occurs in the primary combustion zone, proceeds downward through the fuel bed. And the gases that are produced in the primary combustion zone pass up through a hot char bed where carbon dioxide and water vapor are reduced back to carbon monoxide and hydrogen. The gases leaving the char bed are then mixed with a preheated stream of secondary air. When the gas is mixed with the air in the secondary combustion zone, the flame that heats the cooking surface is formed. A photograph of the secondary combustion zone in a T-LED semi-gas fire cook stove is shown on the right-hand side of this slide. In testing semi-gas fire cook stoves here at our laboratory, we have found that often, in cases where emissions are very high, the overall values that are measured are dominated by large increases in emission rates that occur during transient events, such as startup, refueling, and transition to char combustion. Different stove designs respond differently to these transient events, some more favorably than others. But the point is that emissions can be strongly affected by parameters such as fuel type and operator behavior, and that if we want to design stoves that consistently perform well, both in the laboratory and in the field, we need to focus on designing stoves that are more robust. One of the big questions here is, when we get to the product design stage, can we make a stove that meets the user's needs in the field without sacrificing performance? What will the user want to do after the first batch of fuel is consumed? Will they want to add fresh fuel to continue cooking at high power? Will they want to burn the char that is left over and cook at low power? No matter what they decide to do, can we maintain low emissions? So let's take a look at a comprehensive project overview and talk about how we are working towards semi-gas fire cookstove designs that exhibit lower emissions and more robust performance. Overall, our project includes an experimental component and a modeling component. The experimental component consists of two experiments. The first experiment involves conducting many tests in the laboratory using a modular top-lit updraft semi-gas fire test bed operating under a variety of conditions to generate a map of semi-gas fire cook stove performance. The second experiment involves performing planar laser-induced fluorescence imaging on a semi-gas fire test bed with optical access to gain a greater understanding of the combustion process that takes place in the secondary combustion zone. The modeling component includes the development of a fuel bed model and a reduced gas phase chemical kinetic mechanism, two tasks that are being completed at Princeton University, and the development of a CFD model of the secondary combustion zone here at CSU. The data collected during the experiments will be used to validate the model. Once the models are validated, they can be used to predict the performance of an even wider range of top-lit updraft semi-gas fire cook stove designs. Both of the models are being developed using open source code, and the end goal of the project is to generate knowledge through the experimental data and tools in the form of models that predict stove performance that enable the design of stoves that achieve Tier 4 performance. 
I work on the experimental portion of this project, and today I'm going to talk about the experiments that we have in progress. First, I'll talk about the uh, first set of experiments that we are conducting with the modular test bed. A photograph of the test bed in our emissions hood is shown on the left-hand side of this slide. The geometry of the test bed can be changed easily, and the test bed has been instrumented to provide control over other variables that are expected to affect performance. On the right, a table of the design parameters that can be controlled and varied is shown. These parameters include the pot gap and the secondary air inlet geometry. In this context, secondary air inlet geometry includes not only the geometry of the secondary air opening itself, but also the geometry of the stove adjacent to the secondary air opening in both the upstream and downstream directions. Other parameters that can be controlled include the secondary air temperature, the primary air inlet geometry, the primary air flow rate, and the secondary air flow rate. A second list of fuel-related parameters that will be varied is also shown. These parameters include fuel type, fuel bulk density, and fuel moisture content. We will be testing several fuels, including unprocessed agricultural crop residues and wood fuels that have undergone various degrees of processing. We've been looking to fundamental combustion science to guide us in selecting which cases to test experimentally. And overall, we will be testing several secondary air inlet designs, several air flow rates, and several fuel types to generate a basic map of performance that can first be used to validate the model and then be investigated in more detail using the model. The test bed has also been instrumented to allow several metrics of performance in addition to overall carbon monoxide and particulate matter emissions to be measured. These metrics include the useful power output, or the rate at which energy is transferred to the pot of water, the composition of the gas entering the secondary combustion zone, the rate at which the fuel bed is consumed, and various temperatures throughout the rest of the test bed. Now, let's take a look at the procedure that is being used to measure the performance of the modular test bed. Not only do we need a map of how stove design affects emissions and efficiency under a prescribed set of operating conditions, we also need a map of how operator behavior affects performance and of how stove design affects the robustness of the stove and its ability to exhibit low emissions under a wide range of operating conditions. A test procedure has been developed to capture the performance of the test bed under such a range of conditions, such as startup, steady state consumption of the first batch of fuel, a case in which a second batch of fuel is added on top of the hot char bed left behind after the first batch of fuel is consumed, and the char combustion mode. On this graph, the carbon monoxide emissions trends that are expected to be observed for the average stove and the manner in which gravimetric particulate matter samples will be distributed are shown. We are not only interested in developing a semi-gas fire cook stove that achieves the lowest possible emissions. We are also interested in developing a semi-gas fire cook stove that performs well under all of these operating conditions and that can achieve low carbon monoxide emissions throughout pretty much the entire test procedure. Ideally, the design features that make the stove more robust should also make the stove easier to use and result in overall lower emissions. These tests will provide us with a lot of knowledge that can be used in future design efforts. Here are some preliminary tests that we did to illustrate that we could change parameters like the primary and secondary air flow rates and measure differences in the performance of the test bed. On this graph, the estimated average fuel consumption rate is plotted as a function of primary airflow rate. The points are data from the experiments, and the lines in the background are lines of constant equivalence ratio. Note that this is the equivalence ratio in the fuel bed. The optimum fuel-to-air equivalence ratio in the fuel bed is 4. 
because this is the equivalence ratio at which the chemical energy content of the fuel gas that is produced would be the highest based on chemical equilibrium calculations. The data points, as you can see, all lie reasonably close to the phi equals 4 line, although the points at lower primary airflow rates are shifted towards the phi equals 5 line, and the points at higher primary airflow rates are shifted towards the phi equals 3 line. Here, uh, some useful power output measurements that we took are plotted as a function of primary airflow rate. And again, the different sy symbols denote the different ratios of secondary to primary airflow. The useful power output was calculated as the rate of change of the temperature of the water in the pot. And as expected, the useful power output increased with primary airflow rate. However, the useful power output decreased as the ratio of secondary to primary airflow increased. Um, and this is something that we have to be attentive to in working towards a stove that achieves Tier 4 emissions. Uh, this decrease in useful power output is un unfavorable from the standpoint of thermal efficiency. Now, I'll talk a bit more about the second experiment. In the first experiment, we were primarily focused on understanding overall stove performance, and in the second experiment, we are focused on understanding the combustion process that occurs in the secondary combustion zone in more detail. For this experiment, a two-dimensional approximation of a top-lit updraft semi-gasifier cook stove with optical access has been developed. This optical test bed will be used to collect planar laser-induced fluorescence images of the secondary combustion zone. Uh, just to provide some background on this experimental technique for those who may not be familiar with it, uh, laser-induced fluorescence is when the light from a laser is used to excite a molecule from one electronic energy level to another, and then, because the excited state is unstable, the molecule spontaneously emits a photon and returns to a lower energy state. Planar laser-induced fluorescence, or PLIF, is when the distribution of these photons in a two-dimensional space is imaged to determine the location and concentration of the species of interest. So what does the experimental setup for planar laser-induced fluorescence imaging look like? Well, the light from a pump laser is fed into a dye laser, and the dye laser is used to generate laser light at the precise wavelength needed to excite the species of interest. The light from the dye laser is then formed into a two-dimensional laser sheet, and the laser sheet is passed through the flame. The fluorescence images are recorded on an intensified camera. In this experiment, we will be collecting fluorescence images of the hydroxyl radical. The hydroxyl radical is of interest because a sharp increase in the concentration of the hydroxyl radical marks the location of the high temperature flame front, and because the hydroxyl radical is the primary oxidizer of carbon monoxide. We are also planning to collect soot laser-induced incandescence, or LII, images. To give you an idea of what these images look like, here are example OH plus and soot LII images of two different flames. These images are from a set of PLIF and LII experiments that were performed at Sandia National Laboratories. The false colors represent the relative intensities of the signals in different locations. Together, the OH PLIF and soot LII images of the secondary combustion zone can provide insight into the soot formation and oxidation processes that take place inside of a semi-gasifier cook stove. We hope to be able to answer the questions, where is soot being formed? And where are those locations relative to the secondary flame where soot can be oxidized before it escapes from the stove? What can we do to discourage soot formation? And what can we do to promote soot oxidation? Gaining a greater understanding of how soot is formed and oxidized is especially important because the target for Tier 4 high-power particulate matter emissions is expected to be difficult to reach. Uh, in addition, the OH plus images from these experiments will be used to validate the CFD model of the secondary combustion zone. That just about wraps it up for the overview of the experimental portion of our project. Both of the experiments that I've presented today are in progress, and I invite you to stay tuned 
for published experimental results, and for more information on the models that are under development. With that, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the support of the Department of Energy once again, and I'd like to thank you for listening and take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Jessica. And for everyone, please type your questions into the chat window and we'll address it from there. I think we have a fair number of um, people on this webinar, so the chat will be the easiest way to handle the question. And while those are questions are coming in, um, thank you, Jessica, for sharing that presentation. It was a, a, a really great um, preview of what's to come with some of your research results, um, but I, I think, you know, it's it's nice to have this example of uh, an R&D focused project um, that is also incorporating the ideas of uh, different user uh, variations as well from the start. While we're seeing if there are any questions, the next, uh, to, to tie in this presentation with the next presentation, on the next presentation will be on a stove technology that has been developed. A lot of R&D, as I had mentioned, um, is has been worked out, and now they're really focused on optimizing it for what the user needs are. Um, and it looks like uh, there there are a couple of questions that I think would be handled uh, most easily. Audio through should the be set, and presentation is is getting pulled up right now on the screen. Fantastic. Thank Randy. Thanks, Jessica. It's a delight to be here. Thanks to everybody who's in attendance on this webinar. Uh, we are Go Sign Stowe. We're going to share our findings based on a six-month pilot study that we've been conducting in Guatemala through funding from the Global Alliance for Clean Coast Stoves to uh, to see how effective we can implement a uh, evacuated to solar cooker that we've been developing for the last 10 years into both rural, rural and urban populations. Yeah. Looks like we have um, pulled up the old presentation here, Randy. Uh, there may be some confusion on which files we uh, we need for our presentation. Uh, so if you can handle in the file library the latest document that you've sent today. And Randy, if you can hear me, um, we, we uploaded or we sent several files to you via email this morning. Uh, all the same files starting about 45 minutes ago. Anyway, I'll, I'll continue to talk about GoSun to sort of fill everyone up with uh, what we're up to. Um, bottom line, uh, GoSun is, is trying to lead an effort in uh, fuel-free cooking to reduce you know, the use of solid fuels such as wood and charcoal for cooking and thus reduce respiratory illnesses and also restoring forests while saving money and time for people in the developing world. If you're in this webinar, you know that we're up against a major, major issue with two and a half billion people globally still using wood and charcoal on a daily basis. So we're still looking at the old presentation, Randy. Uh, again, via an email, we had sent the new presentation to you. Yeah, right now we, I think the file names are the same, so we're, we're trying to figure out um, the file name. Which one? Been, it's um, GoSun GACC webinar presentation that was emailed to you today. All right. Are you able to locate that file? Yeah, we have it on email. It's just we've loaded the wrong ones into the system. Fantastic. Thanks. Okay. 
So the Go Sun is is one of the first solar technologies uh, that the Global Alliance has been working with, um, and being solar fueled that uh, obviously uh, negates a lot of the conversation that Jessica had led with, um, and that we don't have to, to to worry about the issues with particulates and combustion. Uh, but obviously, we do have to worry about the issue of providing uh, warm meals when users need them uh, and of complete reliance upon an intermittent energy source of the sun. Uh, typically, solar cookers have been deployed in uh, the global south uh, with mixed results, uh, and um, the reliance on the sun has become one of the biggest impediments to their adoption. Uh, the sun may be intense enough to cook a meal, but in, in very few situations has a solar cooker risen to the primary choice for a family in need based on its inability to cook the meal efficiently, quickly, and reliably due to the concerns of heat loss, cloudy weather, uh, and um, general usability performance. Um, we feel as though we have created an application or a, a technology here that uh, is very well suited, um, and the real secret to our technology is a vacuum between two layers of tough Pyrex glass, and this vacuum creates a perfect insulator and thus prevents the outside ambient temperature from transferring into the inner cooking area. The vacuum tube is um, not new in the solar energy industry, uh, rather uh, it's been applied for solar hot water heating for the last 25 or 30 years and hasn't uh, really been applied to the cooking environment in solar. So we're one of the first to use vacuum evacuated tubes for cooking and the results that we've had are, are really impressive. We're excited to share that with you all. A little background on the team here. Um, you're hearing from Patrick Sherwin, the founder of the company, uh, who also is sitting with the co-founder, Matthew Gillespie. Um, I have about uh, 14 years of experience in renewable energy, solar, wind, biofuels, uh, green building, um, and uh, everything that fits into the into the green energy and green tech sphere. And, and Matthew is uh, very well experienced in the world of industrial design and um, natural materials uh, with a, a lot of experience in, in social innovation and uh, user-centered design process. So we'll be speaking to that a bunch. All right, so, so the slide is Patrick are loaded, uh, so you can jump ahead to um, wherever you, you got to. Thanks for giving some background without the slides, but uh, we should be ready to go with the slides. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Randy. All right, so the ghost sun is pictured in this image here. Uh, we'll get into how that actually works, um, but uh, uh, bottom line is a tubular design, an evacuated tube with reflectors that increase the amount of sunlight that hits the tube and cooking is conducted inside the tube. So yes, this is something that's very new and different, and we like to think that it is changing everything amongst the users that we're identifying. Uh, we were lucky enough to visit our wonderful grant funders at the Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves. We are getting great support from the team, uh, and you know the market sector analysis for Guatemala has been the gospel for us as we've conducted this. So if there's any other cook stove manufacturers out there, the Global Alliance is the best place to start. Um, this pilot study funding has been absolutely critical for us to, you know, to get anywhere close towards uh, towards a successful implementation. Again, a little bit about myself. I've been doing renewable energy work for a long time. A lot of my focus has been in the developing world. This is an image in Haiti. Uh, trying to give power to a remote village. I like to work with appropriate technology, low-cost technology, and wherever there's a, a strong need. Uh, for the last 10 years, I've been working with the GoSun solar cooking technology. 
And for the last three years, we've been focused 100% on the effort. Uh, we launched on Kickstarter about one year ago with the GoSun Sport. This is a portable, high-efficiency solar cooker that literally makes a meal in just 20 minutes. The campaign went off very well, and uh, we have now delivered 1,000 units to uh, customers all over the world, including 40 different countries. Uh, we started a uh, group on Facebook where followers or where people that have backed our campaign and have purchased our product have um, been posting their own recipes, their own ideas for the Ghost Sun Sport. We're engaging these folks in uh, the larger conversation around how we're working to empower a fuel free cooking movement. Uh, and also uh, getting their feedback as we grow our our array of technological options in terms of larger cookers, um, different accessories, more efficient and productive uses of the GoSun. So the, the, the technology of the evacuated tube really uh, gives a bit of a leapfrog to the fuel-free cooking movement in that uh, it's, it's very quick and reliable. Uh, it's able to cook in inconsistent sun. In other words, if it's partly cloudy, the during the shaded or cloudy period of the day, you're able to retain heat and continue to cook the food. The same is true that you can hold on to heat into the night. We have one customer that told us they cooked oatmeal at 7 a.m. and they're eating it. I'm sorry, they cooked oatmeal at 7 p.m. and they're eating a warm oatmeal at 7 a.m. the next morning. It's safe to touch. You can uh, you can touch the tube and the reflectors at any time, even when we see temperatures that achieve around 700 degrees Fahrenheit. It's pretty versatile. Uh, our, we've been doing a lot of frying and steaming and stewing and also baking. We can also um, heat water and essentially boil water. In the uh, the ghost zone, it's very low maintenance. Uh, most of the mess is left inside a stainless steel tray. Uh, it's pretty easy to clean up the tube if and when you have a mess inside the tube. There are, of course, no reoccurring fuel costs, no particle emissions, and the food is cooked very well, uh, very tasty. Uh, the nutrition is retained as well as the food's juices which ends up uh, becoming, you know, a, a soup uh, tomorrow or a, a secondary a meal because folks in these environments where we're working do not want to waste anything. Uh, just a picture, a snapshot here of the cross-section of the ghost sun. Uh, the black lines that are curved on the exterior here are reflectors. Um, as you see, they're accept accepting sunlight and focusing that sunlight onto the evacuated tube where there is a transparent layer on the outside and a opaque layer that's absorbing sunlight, turning it into heat on the inside. Those two layers of glass have a vacuum between them. Again, that vacuum makes a perfect insulator, and that's truly the secret to our technology. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand it over here to Matt Gillespie to give you the meat of the presentation. Hi, Matt Gillespie here. Good morning, everyone. Um, so at the, the center of the project uh, in Guatemala is human-centered design. So I wanted to quickly give you IDO's definition of it to give you an idea of well, what the process is that we undertook. And, and the real benefit of human-centered design is that you get to see problems from the user's perspective and that you can start to empathize with people as individuals and see new opportunities that hadn't presented themselves. And I think it's safe to say that any project uh, in, a de in a developing market like this needs to have human-centered design at the, at the center and forefront because you're not just making a technology, but you're making uh, something of a cultural artifact. Um, so, move on. Okay, so within our study, we were focusing on three different areas that we needed to really succeed at to really have any chance of long-term success with our business. So in the, the social sphere, we're looking at how people perceive the stove. What are their aspirations? What are the cultural factors around cooking? What are the interfamilial uh, dynamics? Um, on the technical side, we're looking at some concepts that we brought with us that we wanted to experiment or validate with. 
that the users didn't ask for. Um, then I'll examining as well durability and the perf how we can increase the performance of the stoves. And then finally, the economic area. So exploring how much fuel does this really save? What are the uh, key values that we could use to bring a user to purchase? And what are the financial options that we can create? So micro, uh, micro loans uh, and so forth. Uh, so what does that combination look like for us to move forward and find success in Guatemala? Um, the project was broken into three phases of iterative uh, prototyping and validation. And with each phase, we focused our questions, um, focused our concepts, but also gave ourselves the ability to expand with new technologies and new concepts for, for validation. And then finally, within the third phase, we brought our final prototype to the market to see what the pilot, the, uh, pilot participants uh, would be willing to pay for uh, our devices. And currently, we're in the third phase uh, in the lead up to our buyback test, in which we'll get the final validation uh, of our proposed price point and give us that extra information we need to make the final uh, business decisions or lay the path forward. So initial challenges with setting up this project. This is uh, something both Patrick and I have experience with uh, working in the developing world and design process, but it's safe to say we've never done a project quite like this. Um, so some of the initial challenges included hiring talent in Guatemala that was not only um, skilled and qualified to be conducting uh, human-centered design research, but also understood the social and political context in Guatemala and knew how to get things done there. Um, so, for example, manufacturing, as you can see in this photograph, it's Manufacturing in Guatemala, as well as uh, I'd imagine many other developing countries, is a very personal affair. And developing trust uh, takes time. So your design researcher becomes not only an investigative um, party, but also a person who has to be on the ground being the face for the brand and, and your reputation moving forward. And then uh, finally, of course, the language barrier, uh, getting making sure that the staff in the U.S. was connected uh, at all times under being fully aware of what was taking place and communicating the research insights uh, well amongst the whole team. So, and that we've learned quite a bit throughout the process. Um, so uh, we were surprised that from the beginning, uh, bringing the stove down, people really responded to it. The, uh, the value proposition of not collecting linea or, the, or fuel wood um, really resonated with people not, not only in um, extreme poverty, but even middle class people, um, the hands off nature of the stove and just the wow factor quickly led people to to uh, oh, to get past the form factor, the, the reality of cooking in a tube. Uh, so we're we're pleasantly pleasantly surprised wherever we took it that people from all types of backgrounds uh, were interested. <laughs> Um, but that's not to say we didn't learn a lot within our, our first pilot. So we have here an image of uh, something that we came back to, our, our pilot participants, uh, about 15 women in, in urban and rural context with two different community partners, used the technology for two weeks. Um, and when we uh, came back to see our initial prototypes, we were surprised to find all of the caps that we had created were covered uh, in aluminum foil. Uh, and the, the, there's a, this is more on the technological side of learning. Uh, we realized we had created these caps from uh, corn cobs and corn leaves that we were hoping to, um, that, uh, sorry, interesting, <laughs> that uh, we thought would be a good, no waste, um, affordable way. And initially, uh, to insulate the tube, and initially it did work very well, but with two weeks of testing, they, they, they had shrunken and fried up. But the, we have to give credit to our pilot participants. They were very innovative and made their own solutions to continue using the stove. Uh, another thing we noticed was that the stoves that we had given um, were not uh, were not uh, always being used the way we had thought. So you see an example here. Um, initially, we imagined the stove to be used on the ground or had no uh, not thought so much. Okay. Had not thought so much about the the. Uh, that aspect of its use. And so when we returned, we found that the users had uh, been putting their, uh, been placing their stoves on chairs so they wouldn't have to bend down. This is an example of not only human factors 
uh, coming into play, but also uh, the sociological sphere. So it looks regressive uh, to use um, to be on the ground. Here's an example of one of the trades we started with where the manufacturing process um, led us to make square trays because we were unable to find uh, higher capacity trays. Uh, but we were surprised to find, uh, so we ended up having to bring trays from the United States uh, down in order to complete the, the prototyping. Um, but we found that the trays are an example where users from different backgrounds preferred different trays, and we're going to have to integrate that into our, our business model moving forward. So uh, we have we have here some learning to hand, hand off the patches. Okay, yeah, guys, we're, we're going to have to wrap up real quick here, but um, I think the big one for us was that we found our um, users were saving at least two hours every day uh, by using the ghost sun. Again, we're not trying to necessarily replace other stoves. We're just trying to augment. Um, and uh, it's a, it's a pretty strong uh, value proposition when you can say, hey, how about uh, uh, you know 15 hours a week uh, if you if you get our stove that you'll have to do other things. So to, to uh, uh, the other things that we like to point out, uh, if if you're doing this work, um, we really do encourage you to to focus the effort towards women. Um, they keep the hearth. You know, they they are the makers of the meals in, in the world, pretty much. At, at if you're not working very closely with also women-run businesses that can have that same level of empathy. And by hiring women within your design process, you uh, open the door to really understand and create that bridge of empathy with the women users. Um, so it's important to not only work with women, but hire women as well. Um, our preliminary findings, uh, again, we are still conducting our pilot at the moment, but we found that 100% of our participants want our pro product and that 62% of them were willing to pay at our proposed price. So these are pretty successful findings. Uh, we do think we have a business in this developing world, but um, we also recognize we need to do a bit more to find the right partners, to line up financing and to, uh, to eventually start to make a fuel uh, a fuel conversion switch away from what they're familiar with, wood and charcoal, and towards potentially solar and, and maybe even uh, propane so that we can uh, completely remove uh, particulate matters from the home. Um, so we, we need to do some more longer-term testing. Uh, we need to do some better kitchen performance tests. And of course, explore these. Uh, what are our different financial options in order uh, for us to achieve a larger scale success? Um, yeah, great. It looks like we have some questions here in the public chat that are that uh, are really compelling. So yeah, for the sake of time, can you answer those through the chat window? I'm sorry for having to to con condense things. Um, but we're running a little bit for this on the delay. All right. Thank you all for your time. It was our pleasure to uh, share our, our advice and experience with you all. Thanks for the presentation. It sounds like based on the questions, um, there are lots of um, – there's lots of – people are intrigued um, in this. Um, and then what we'll do now while um, Patrick and Matt are – responding to the questions in the chat window, we will use this time to load up the next presentation. The next presentation is from Karen Carter from Catapult Design, um, and she's going to talk about some of their experiences in cook stoves and in other designing other technologies as well. So, Karen, I'm going to unmute you from here. Great. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'll jump right in and, and try to breathe through this pretty quickly. Uh, I work, my name is Fawn Carter, and I work for Catapult Design. We're a small firm, um, a team of human-centered product and industrial designers, and that means we do a little engineering and a little art at the same time, and we specialize on uh, products and services for the development sector. And 
Um, three main offerings are design, the full spectrum service from concept to commercialization. And um, as I said earlier, it's a human-centered approach, which um, Matt and Patrick touched upon. Um, it's an iterative process that really looks at the human at the center of it all and, and their pain points and their situation, their context. And then it's all about iterating, prototyping, and testing, and then going back to the drawing boards and refining the design as much as possible. Uh, we also do just purely research where we uh, do deep dives into the user and user context just to address your specific challenge with the new lens or just fresh eyes. And then our last offering is in education. We do specific uh, human-centered design research works, workshops on, on specific methods such as prototyping or uh, data synthesis. So those – oh, I'm sorry. I have been not advancing the slides, so there we go. Design, research, education, all together. Those are some of the, the clients that we've worked for. And I'm going to use the rest of my presentation time to talk about uh, how we at Catapult balance performance and usability. And and we know, as, as Rain touched upon, that these aren't the only factors. Um, often others weigh even heavier than either of these. But uh, today I just want to talk specifically about these two. And, um, you know, when I sat down and initially thought about this, I was thinking, is it art or science? And I'm going to claim here it's a little bit of both and briefly show you two examples we've worked on outside of cookstoves but within the global health realm, and then look at one example outside of both of our worlds, all of our worlds, I think, maybe not everyone's, but, um, you know, look at these different high-tech and low-tech innovations and see if they can shed some light on designing cookstoves with a human-centered approach. So there's my little gift <laughs> back and forth. So the first example is... Um, is a food product that we worked on with um, or for Living Foods organization. They use kind of an Avon-like sales model to sell health products mainly to low-income Ugandans and Kenyans via door-to-door -door model, this Avon lady-style model. And um, this, you know, included a lot of research on our on our end on the best nutritional combination. So for the best performing product, we needed as much nutrition packed into each spoonful as possible. But this mix wasn't a very tasty mix. So we added sugar, making it easier to eat or more usable. So sugar does have some nutritive value, but not much. So we were sacrificing performance in this case. And in the end, we needed something people would eat every day and buy, not once, but every week or so. So we needed something they liked. And ultimately, we decided to add the sugar and we wanted to also add fat um, in the form of milk solids because this made the product a lot tastier and uh, better texture. But this turned out was um, cost prohibitive. So uh, cost aside, uh, usability weighed heavier in this specific low-tech example. Okay, on to the next one. It's a, um, a off-grid hand-washing station for... Uh, Kenyan, rural Kenyans, and Curry urban Kenyans. And we did this for Innovations for Poverty Action. And we, the, the performance factors we wanted to optimize here were a frugal yet sufficient water and soap flow. But from a human-centered standpoint, the device required users, users to change habits. And this is an extra, um, an extra special ask, as, as I'm sure you're all aware of, um, like, like, with cook stoves. It's a, it's a daily habit they're asking you to change up. So we needed an extra incentive uh, in the usability, usability realm to measure this behavior change. It's, it, our device here is far from being proven, but we think the phone might be a little, the, the big little innovation here because it adds both usability, um, it's immediately visual and sensual, and it adds to the performance of the device by being more soap frugal. The device you see here in the picture actually has a capacity for 500 single shots of soapy foam, and each shot enough to sufficiently wash your hands. So in this case, performance um, versus usability, it's a little bit more equal, but usability still kind of came out on top. And now, out, going outside of our world, um, 
looking at, I tried to think of something where performance would win. And if you look at a racing car, I mean, it's all about the speed and, um, and all of those other factors that contribute to the speed. And the ultimate goal here, though, is to race or to, or recreation. And, um, and so performance is golden in this case. But there's a big but here. At, at the end of the day, these performance factors translate directly into usability factors. They're, they're um, instantly felt in the feedback of the wheel or the, um, the touch of the pedal. And they, they translate viscerally to, to enhance the usability of the device. And yes, this is, you know, um, the, the user also is not your average user. They develop motor skills and muscle power to control this car and enhance its performance and usability. But, um, I wanted to throw this example in because I think it's a good example of when performance and usability go hand in hand. I think Ferrari has used it well in their commercial cars by incorporating the sound of that engine into their, their consumer mass market models. And so now to, to go, you know, I tread lightly here because I'm by no means an expert in cook stoves, but I'm going to go out on a limb here and hypothesize about stoves. Um, so it's a, it's a kitchen appliance and also a public health technology, like the other two examples I showed you, the hand washing station and the uh, fortified porridge. It's intended for everyday use for average users. And one of the main benefits of this product, it's not instant. It's, it's realized over time and with consistent use, the main health benefit. So for those reasons, we claim, Catapult claims that usability still, still weighs more. But with that said, there are performance factors somewhat similar to the, the, the Formula One car that translate viscerally to an immediate perceivable benefit, something that is felt by our senses. And that, for example, like being able to quickly cook your, your grits translates to quickly satisfying your hunger. So in this case, performance and usability are not necessarily mutually exclusive and can go hand in hand. And the performance factors actually amplify the usability of the stove. Um, but before the, the engineer side of me gets too excited about this and thing, I also imagine it's pretty tough with stoves because there are some performance features, maybe all, um, that work directly against usability features. And, for example, the low admission performance versus certain people's taste for smoky wood-cooked food. Um, so from a human-centered perspective on stove design, I think usability, again, wins in this scenario. Uh, in conclusion, that's kind of how we see the world. Uh, but uh and because of that it's 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 our humble recommendation to weigh usability greater in these everyday products that we want everyday people to buy and use, and especially in these health products that require habitual change to give one the the delayed return on investment and um because it's so important we we um we also recommend that this takes place in the research stage of R&D rather than the development stage, so sooner rather than later. And we feel that real innovation occurs when both of these are hand in hand, or hand in hand, performance and usability are one and the same and enhance each other. And that is the end. I'll take the questions um, via the chat window, please. Thank you, Karin, for a lot of good food for thought and good examples from other sectors. Um, and, yes, please send questions through the chat window. I just sent one as well um, for a question for discussion for everyone. And uh, please continue through the chat window while we get set up with the next presentation. Okay. I'm Elliot Levine. I'm with the U.S. Department of Energy's Biomass Energy Technology Office. Uh, much of the work of this office is involved in biofuels, but uh, it's been a pleasure to have been associated with uh, this cook stove initiative. And I need you to go to the next slide. So uh, I'm going to take a few minutes. Uh, unlike the other um, many, some of the other presentations, uh, I'm 
really not going to focus on any particular projects. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our engagement and how the DOE has been involved, tell you about uh, our portfolio of projects, some of the technical advances, and uh, our interest in improving the data quality and the science uh, and understanding and ultimately how this information can get shared. Um, so we divided up the work that we've done to date into three phases. The first phase began with the development of a cook stove workshop. Um, which ultimately tied into the subsequent solicitation that we had run. So at that workshop, which was held, uh, I guess, in January of 2011 uh, and followed by the report in May 11, there were four findings. Uh, these are listed here that we could reduce emissions by 90 percent. We can obtain uh, an, an achievable uh, efficiency uh, improvement of two, two times, so we get a 50 percent improvement in fuel savings as well. Uh, the recognition that no single cook stove solution would adequately address the entire cook stove challenge, that we would like to have technical research and development both guide and be guided by field research and implementation programs. And lastly, that the cost and performance trade-offs associated with the use of processed versus unprocessed fuels should be explored. We've not really gotten into the fuels aspect of, uh, of, of this recommendation. Okay. So uh, from there, we move to a solicitation, actually two solicitations. Uh, one was a competitive – they were all competitively based – uh, one was a more conventional solicitation. The second was uh, an SBIR opportunity. And what we were seeking here were technology enhancements leading to improved uh, performance. Um, the other thing, the goals that we were after increased the viability and deployment of renewable energy technologies through research, development, and tools that lead to clean and efficient biomass cookstoves. Uh, one of the things I'd like to mention is these were major projects. Uh, we weren't after incremental enhancements, but really uh, large-scale improvements in uh, both our understanding of the combustion, uh, and you heard a little bit about this from CSU, and technology improvements. So the solicitation had two topics. You see them listed here, development of innovative cookstove designs that allow users to burn wood or crop residues more efficiently with less pollution than traditional stoves. And the second was improved understanding of our combustion physics, thereby enabling future developments in cookstoves design. And it is our goal, and I'll be talking a little later about this, that we really want this, the knowledge, the know-how, the show-how, and uh, other results from these efforts to uh, make their way to stove developers and designers for ultimate use. And the, lastly, the SBIR topic was on clean biomass cookstoves technologies. Uh, and we had two awards in this area. So now we moved to what we call the phase two, and that is we issued, we issued nine awards. Um, most of these awards were for projects of three-year duration, and many of these, pro all of these projects are largely still in progress and still being worked on. Uh, I'm not going to talk about individual projects, but again, you did hear from CSU a minute ago, but we issued, on the basis of the solicitation, uh, five competitively selected projects. Uh, we did this in two tranches. The first ones went to BioLite, Colorado State University, and RTI, Research Triangle Institute. And later, um, when we had additional funds, we came back and supported APROVECHO and University of Washington. Uh, we issued two projects to national laboratories. Uh, we issued one to Oak Ridge National Laboratory on combustion combustor material durability, really looking at uh, materials improvement in the combustion space and the hearth. And secondly, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab that's developed 
uh, an advanced biomass research grade cook stove that we hope to be able to use later on to evaluating prototypes, to compare to other stoves, uh, and to increase the, the quality of data that we have um, uh, going forward. There were two SBIR projects, one of which was also to BioLite, uh, to cut toxic emissions, and secondly, to uh, Berkeley Air Monitoring Group uh, that's developed the PICA, the Platform for Integrated Cook Stove Assessments, um, uh, to monitor in-home impacts of household energy interventions. There are many ways we can characterize these projects. Uh, I'm just showing one scheme that's uh, where the first five of them that are listed are designed to develop a low-cost, durable stove uh, to achieve these efficient, uh, stringent standards and uh, efficiency goals. These are advanced stoves. Secondly is the type that, uh, of work that is being done by CSU, Oak Ridge, and Lawrence Berkeley to understanding the fundamental engineering science for advanced cook stove. Uh, the kind of work you heard about uh, earlier in this webinar uh, where we understand the kinetics of combustion. We hope, again, this, although it will end up in a fairly sophisticated model, uh, will uh, be applied to many down the stoves downstream. Um, we had Aprovecho and uh, looking at identifying stove designs to meet local cooking needs. Uh, and then again, you have some of the other nuances being examined for successful stove dissemination and understanding field performance. Uh, in the case of Berkeley Air Monitoring, that through their stove use uh, monitoring uh, devices or sums. So uh, I've told you about phase one being the workshop and solicitation, phase two, the cook stoves, uh, research, development, demonstration, and the development of high quality data. Uh, lastly, we'd like to see the, this, this kind of knowledge uh, being shared. <clears throat> and so what, we what we're hoping for and are trying to move towards is uh, what do we need to do? We'll have existence proof of many of these advanced stoves. So what should we be doing next? How do we get it into the hands of others that could benefit from understanding uh, these advancements and this know-how? So some of the things I've listed under phase three uh, regard uh, uh, elements that can be used to to uh, promote tech transfer, commercial commercialization, and collaboration for the purposes of facilitating adoption. We'd like to see these results disseminated, the lessons learned uh, you know, being moved into the hands of others that could be used to use it. So we hope to develop uh, and organize a high-quality conference for the cook stove community to share knowledge. I believe we're, we're hoping to be a part of the Ethos Conference that will be coming up in the third week of January of 2015. We, we hope to use the research stove at LBNL to assist with uh, lab test protocols uh, and helping others understand the use of necessary equipment for testing their stoves. We'd like to test prototypes, compare the, the results of uh, various stoves. We'd also like to get involved in performing life cycle analyses of the emissions from the use of different fuels and looking at it over the entire supply chain from uh, harvesting through use and seeing what kinds of emissions would be obtained uh, in, in that when they're compared. Uh, we hope uh, to organize a workshop on stove use monitoring to understand the state of the art and what are the future needs, uh, and also identify other markets where new cook stove technology that we've supported could be embedded. One example might be heating stoves. Uh, other examples could be the emergency commercial feeding market, uh, just to name a couple. But if there are others, uh, I'd welcome your telling us about this. And then lastly, to uh, develop peer-reviewed research and publications to see that this data gets into uh, the public domain. 
So what else is needed to achieve large-scale impact? You know, by the end of the projects, we will have existence proof showing that we can, that via the use of knowledge and technologies, we can improve uh, the efficiency, we could reduce emissions. But it would be um, a little premature for us to suggest that we've solved, that solves the problem and they can be deployed successfully without, without further efforts. Um, or to, that we could use this information to, to suggest that we've solved all the technical hurdles and now these can be deployed. So what else is needed? Um, we think some of those follow-up efforts should be in uh, continuing, redoubling our efforts to fully understand the new engineering science that makes stoves uh, at low cost durable and these technology improvements to achieve uh, these, uh, these stringent uh, goals. That this new engineering science that we'll have uh, supported will, could be internalized by many others, such as stove developers and designers, to develop a variety of new kinds of stoves that will meet local cooking needs, uh, and that gets to the tech transfer efforts. And lastly, that uh, we have more sustained, more and sustained rigorous research to further understand the nuances of successful stove dissemination and field performance. Um, so that we better understand what actually works, what works well in the lab would also work in the field, um, what doesn't, and why. And that's uh, really all I have. Thank you, Elliot. Um, and thanks for everyone for staying with us, even though we've gone over time a little bit. I uh, apologize again for all of the delays. Um, please send any questions uh, to Elliot and also uh, feedback on the DOE activities in general through the chat window. And fortunately, we have also scheduled to have this be a theme and topic for multiple webinars into the future. So while we don't have enough time to have much discussion about a lot of these issues and trade-offs and questions, we will have opportunity um, to revisit some of these issues and themes in the, into the future. So we'll keep the webinar window open uh, for people to continue to ask questions. Um, and we'll also record questions so that any unanswered questions, we can follow up with people as well. And thank you so much, Elliot, and also to all of our presenters today. You're welcome.